So I know that all of you were looking forward to this conversation that we will have over, well, I was going to say over lunch, but instead I'll say right now. So I hope that you've attended lots of uh, important uh, panels and enjoyed the conversations and the presentations and that you've been building community with people that you may not necessarily have known before. And you'll have the rest of the day to continue to do that. So I highly encourage you to do so. So over lunch, we'll have a conversation and I wanna introduce the three people who will talk about the University of California's involvement and case um, addressing DACA and the rescission of DACA. So first, once again, I wanna introduce our wonderful, brilliant president of the University of California, President Janet Napolitano. It's because of you, President Napolitano, that we are all here today. So can we please, once again, thank our president for her support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanna add a, a few more details um, to her bio and about the case before I introduce the other two people who will be um, presenting here today over lunch. So I already spoke about her being the 20th president, the first woman, her distinguished career in public service herself, and the fact that she played a role in having the University of California system be the first to file the lawsuit in the DACA case. Now the injunctions that were granted in that case have allowed more than 500,000 500,000 DACA recipients, including many members of the University of California community, to renew their authorizations to live and work in the United States. So thank you so much for bringing that suit and having the courage to do so. The next person I want to bring to the stage is Jeffrey M. Davidson, who is a partner at Covington and Burling. And earlier today, you heard some of the deans on the panel talk about the importance of thinking about public service broadly, right? doing public interest and social justice work directly, and also doing that important work in a white shoe law firm like Jeffrey Davidson has done at Covington and Burling. He's a partner there. I won't talk about all of the major cases that he does as a partner there. He does lots of work in high stakes commercial and insurance coverage matters. He's very successful. But he also represents the University of California in its challenge to the government's rescission of the DACA program. And he, along with his team, was responsible for obtaining a nationwide injunction that reinstated DACA. And he defended that successfully on appeal. Now the case was cited by the American lawyer, the case that he worked on, this DACA case, was cited by the American lawyer when it named Covington the California Litigation Department of the Year. So thank you for being here so much and for your work on the case. And finally, I would like to introduce our moderator. Our moderator, please come up to the stage. And our moderator is Professor Monica Almadani, who I'm very proud to say is currently a visiting professor at UCI Law and co-director of the Immigrate, sorry, Immigrant Rights Clinic at UCI Law. She has practiced her entire career in immigrant rights, civil rights, and criminal law. She's been doing that for over a decade, including working at the ACLU's Immigrants Rights Project and the US Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. She also worked at Covington, and it was during her time at Covington that she was a part of a senior team representing the University of California in the DACA case. So please give a warm welcome to our three panelists this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real honor to be here with President Napolitano and with my good friend from Covington and Burling, uh, Jeff Davidson. So today we're going to have a discussion about the DACA litigation, and I want to start at the very beginning, at the start. Um, President Napolitano, as Secretary of Homeland Security, you were the architect 
of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, the DACA program. Can you walk us through your thought process, legal and otherwise, around creating the program in 2012? So uh, immigration um, enforcement is uh, a, a very uh, difficult um, uh, set of issues. Uh, and in part because the nation sorely needs comprehensive immigration reform, uh, which we uh, fought for uh, in, in the Obama administration. Uh, uh, but there was a particular group, uh, they became known in the public eye as the Dreamers, although they themselves don't particularly care for that uh, name. Uh, but these are pe young people brought to this country at the average age of uh, less than six years. Uh, they've grown up in the United States. Uh, they are attending college. They're in our military. Uh, and uh, they were caught because they were undocumented. Uh, and so uh, there were several attempts in the Congress to try to address the this population that failed. And um, as it seemed to me that we needed to look then at what the executive branch could do uh, uh, to, to uh, provide relief from deportation for these young people uh, and also connected with that, give them uh, work authorization. Uh, and so, um, I sent uh, uh, the folks at DHS uh, to, to go back and give me a plan. And they came back with a plan, but it only applied to young people who were already in deportation proceedings. And that was very, very few. And I was like, no, we want to cover these young people so they don't have to be looking over their shoulders over the time worrying if there's an ICE agent nearby. And so they can get uh, work authorization. Um, and so uh, we went back to the law books. Uh, and under the theory of prosecutorial discretion, which is a longstanding uh, theory that uh, when you are doing law enforcement, you, the executive branch retains the discretion to prioritize. It doesn't. The Department of Justice, for example, doesn't bring bad check cases. It brings bank fraud cases and so forth. And so using that theory, uh, we proposed uh, the creation of uh, uh, what became known as DACA, um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, we went uh, back and forth uh, with the White House on it. They wanted to be sure that it was legally sound uh, for the executive branch to do it. Um, we went to DOJ and the Office of Legal Counsel and got confirmation that we could indeed um, uh, enact a program like DACA. Uh, and so um, I then um, uh, announced it in June of 2012 uh, with a memoranda to the leadership uh, of the Department of Homeland Security and the president uh, then uh, announced the program from the Rose Garden. Uh, and so uh, we were off and running. We didn't know um, uh, when we started. And by the way, it was announced and it was to be up and running in 60 days. So we created this, you know, creating a whole program in 60 days, is, it's like, it's not done. <laughs> well, we did it. And we didn't know um, on day one whether we'd have, you know, 50 or 5,000 or 15,000. Uh, uh, in the end, um, some three quarters of a million young people uh, are in the DACA program. Uh, and, um, and, and I'll just close by saying, uh, whenever you do anything in the immigration world, you expect to be attacked either from uh, the immigrant rights advocates or uh, uh, the right wing. Um, uh, but on this, it was, uh, there was really 
very, very little pushback. And the polling on DACA since its inception has been uh, very positive, uh, viewed very positively across both parties. Um, uh, it's, it's really, uh, uh, and it's because I think Americans agree with the values that underlie it, and they understand uh, the reasoning for it. So, but that's the story. I was at the Department of Justice when you enacted the policy, and I remember we were all very surprised that it was never meaningfully challenged. And I think that's, as you said, it was a very popular idea and a very popular policy. In 2016, obviously, President Trump got elected, and early on in his administration, he issued various executive memos regarding um, immigration enforcement, both in the interior and at the border. And in one of those memos, um, the administration was very explicit that they were not going to touch the DACA program, that they were going to preserve that program. And Secretary Kelly, several months later, issued a separate memo where he also made that explicit. The DACA was to be preserved. Now, in September of 2017, something changed. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what led to the UC suing the Trump administration and talk about the rescission decision. So what happened is a bunch of Republican state attorneys general uh, wrote a letter to Attorney Gen then Attorney General Jeff Sessions and, and basically said that unless the administration withdrew the DACA program, they were going to sue the administration and, and uh, uh, put a stop to it. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, within da days of receiving that communication, uh, Attorney General uh, Sessions uh, uh, had a little press conference and announced that uh, uh, DACA was illegal um, and it was going to be rescinded. Uh, and uh, at that point, the then Secretary of Homeland uh, Security uh, uh, issued a memo basically saying, uh, very short, uh, basically saying uh, DACA was illegal, um, uh, it's going to go away, and it's going to go away at, in the following, with the following time frame. So it was a phase out. Uh, um, you know, having been at the birthing of DACA um, and being a lawyer myself, um, I didn't think it was illegal. Uh, and uh, so uh, we um, quickly um, uh, began thinking what could the University of California do because we knew we had a lot of DACA uh, enrollees uh, in our student body. Um, and uh, somehow we got connected with Covington. Uh, we had uh, a couple of conference calls. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, very soon thereafter filed suit to enjoin the rescission. And then Jeff can take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jeff, tell us um, a little bit about how Covington got involved. And uh, well, uh, this maybe goes to one of the points uh, from this morning's panel about, uh, about networking. Uh, the president uh, reached out to us uh, because uh, several of our partners at Covington in Washington uh, had worked with her in the Obama administration, um, and that eventually sort of got, got me involved uh, in the case. Uh, we had been advising uh, corporate clients on, you know, what's going to happen if DACA is rescinded? What's going to happen to our employees uh, who have uh, DACA? So we had worked up, you know, some legal challenges, uh, you know, just predictively about what, the, uh, what would happen if there was a, a rescission. Um, and my memory of those conference calls were uh, basically, uh, well, we think we've got very good arguments under the Administrative Procedure Act to challenge this activity. Uh, uh, in this decision by the administration, and like five seconds later, the president said, all right, let's sue him. Um, Making me, I think, the only cabinet secretary to have sued her successor. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but you know, we all recognize there was a, a huge imperative to move quickly. So I mean, I think the, the rescission was announced, I want to say, on a, a Thursday. Uh, I think the university had its lawsuit on file uh, the next Wednesday, uh, the, first, uh, the first lawsuit anywhere in the country. Um, and the case uh, was a, a complete rocket ship. I mean, it, uh, I think, goes to uh, kind of the challenge of, uh, of, you know, bringing a major piece of civil rights litigation like this. Uh, the clock was, was counting down uh, to when uh, the administration was going to take the position that former DACA recipients uh, could be arrested and deported. Uh, and so the entire timetable on which the case was litigated was uh, extraordinarily uh, complex. Um, and so we, we really put together an army of, of lawyers. Uh, Monica was a, a key uh, participant in that effort. Um, the judge that we drew in San Francisco, Judge Alsup, uh, uh, his, his first request to us was, uh, I need to know some things about immigration law. I don't know very much about immigration law. Uh, can you give me a tutorial on immigration law? And uh, Monica uh, sort of brilliantly uh, went in with a slide presentation and gave the, uh, the history of immigration law in 45 minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I am convinced that you know, that presentation was the, you know, kind of the cornerstone of him starting to understand you know, how to build the case that the rescission was unlawful and the, and the DACA was legal. Well, there were many lawsuits um, challenging mm -hmm the decision to rescind the DACA program. Jeff, can you talk a little bit about the UC case and how it relates to some of the other cases that are out there? The state of California obviously also sued the Trump administration. How did all of the various cases sort of come together? Yeah. Um, um, well, I mean, so the, you know, the policy of rescinding DACA is, uh, uh, you know, horrific is a word that I've used in court, and it is horrific. I mean, if, uh, if implemented uh, the way it was originally intended, uh, there are 700,000 young people across the United States. Uh, uh, they are young adults uh, for the most part. Uh, they have 200,000 uh, U.S. citizen children that they're supporting through lawful work under the DACA policy. Um, and... Uh, if DACA were rescinded, you know, they would go back to an undocumented status where they would be subject to arrest and deportation at any time. They would not be able to lawfully work in the United States. Um, and that has ripple effects you know, throughout the whole of American society. Um, and so one of the things that's been consistent about this case is that uh, uh, so many different uh, facets of American civil society have come together. So th there were lawsuits that were brought by individual DACA participants. Uh, lawsuits that were brought by the state of California and other state attorneys general, uh, lawsuits brought by private companies like Microsoft, uh, lawsuits brought by advocacy organizations. Um, so in California, we were joined uh, in the litigation by the state of California, the city of San Jose, um, and some of the individual uh, plaintiffs. So we really had um, kind of a phalanx of lawyers uh, available to help us um, uh, move the case forward on the timetable that was demanded. Um, and then meanwhile, sort of in succession across the country, there was a New York case and a Maryland case uh, and a Washington, D.C. case, uh, kind of moving, uh, moving forward about sort of six weeks behind ours. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was constant communication, uh, you know, among the cases, making sure that the positions were consistent. Um, and uh, you know, ultimately, it's interesting. The, the case is at the Supreme Court, uh, but uh, the district judges in San Francisco and DC and New York all found that the rescission was unlawful. Uh, and then the Ninth Circuit uh, found that the rescission was unlawful. Uh, the, uh, the Fourth Circuit, uh, on review of uh, an opposite decision in Maryland, found that the rescission was unlawful. So there's unanimity uh, at, the, at the circuit level uh, that the policy um, uh, is unlawful. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think that's a helpful factor as the Supreme Court looks at it. They usually like to uh, uh, evaluate circuit splits. There, there is no circuit split in this case. Can you both talk about the role that UC students played in the case, particularly with respect to um, the district court litigation and declarations that were filed there? Um, 
Well, maybe, maybe I can talk about the, the brass tacks and the president can, can address the, the greater contributions. Um, so, you know, the, the grand strategy of our preliminary injunction motion was to take this, uh, this half page letter from the attorney general saying DACA is unlawful and a three page memo from uh, the acting secretary of Homeland Security rescinding DACA which was the entire reasoning behind rescinding this incredibly valuable program. And, and our basic concept was, you know, administrative law requires the government to act reasonably, to explain its actions reasonably, and to consider the relevant factors. And they tried to do that in these three-page, thinly reasoned memoranda. And so our, you know, big strategy was we're going to take uh, the consequences of that action the consequences of, on the individuals who are affected, the consequences on their employers, uh, the consequences to their studies, the schools they attend, uh, if they're teachers uh, of K through 12, the impacts on their students, you know, the impacts on the US tax base and the economy. And we are going to document that into infinity. And we're going to stack up that documentation against the absurd reasoning uh, that the government put forward for this decision and just say there's no, this is, that is not rational uh, administrative decision making. Um, so in order to do that, uh, uh, you know, we started with UC students um, and we quickly identified a number of incredibly brave uh, UC uh, DACA participants who were, who were willing to come into federal court you know, and put their story on paper and, you know, accept the consequences of, of doing that and, and tell their story. Um, so that was kind of the backbone of our, our, of our submission. Um, and around each of the UC DACA participants, we kind of built this, this little story and we, we went to their professors and said, what are the contributions uh, they're making in the classroom? Uh, uh, some of them worked at research centers and were conducting independent research. So we went to the uh, people whose research depended on their research, and said, how does this person affect you? Uh, and so we tried to build the story that there's this huge network of relationships uh, around every single one of these DACA participants, you know, and to show that really graphically. Um, so, you know, I really think the cornerstone of our case and why we've been successful so far, um, you know, has to do with the courage of those UC students to, you know, step forward and say, you know, here I am. Uh, you know, explain why the government is doing this to me. And I, I think that's been effective. Right, and so we also um, uh, worked with our uh, uh, undocumented uh, students legal services center that's uh, based out of Davis, uh, but that reaches out to all the campuses uh, to uh, encourage an, anybody uh, in, in DACA uh, to re-enroll uh, um, so that, uh, you know, if in the end we were to be unsuccessful, there at, there at least DACA participation uh, could continue for a couple of years. Uh, and so we uh, re-enrolled re several thousand uh, DACA uh, students uh, through that mechanism. And then uh, as we uh, headed to um, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, there was a whole uh, uh, student uh, advocacy effort. Um, uh, 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 they, a number of uh, students came back to Washington. Uh, some of them actually got in the courtroom, although the Supreme Court room is very small, so not a lot of them were able to get inside, but they were on the steps. Um, uh, and, and they were uh, uh, having their voices heard. And uh, uh, several of them uh, also agreed to do media interviews and tell their stories. Uh, so we were uh, uh, having the students participate by, as Jeff indicated, kind of building this kind of DACA ecosystem around what legally was uh, sounds like a very dry topic, which was did, did the government abide by the Administrative Procedures Act when it rescinded DACA? Uh, and, and, and we wanted the court uh, to really see the human faces uh, that um, uh, would be impacted by its decision. And President Napolitano, you were there the day of the argument in November. Can you share a little bit about just how you felt personally 
um, about the argument and just being there for, for this is a special moment, really. Right. So um, uh, the the you know the argument it, it itself um, uh, focused on. Uh, whether the government abided by uh, the Administrative Procedure Act, um, uh, and our and our basic the core of our argument was that uh, basing a decision like this on an incorrect legal ruling, i.e., that DACA was illegal, um, uh, with really no further analysis. Uh, of the costs or benefits of its decision, of the impacts of its decision, et cetera, uh, rendered the rescission arbitrary and capricious, to use the, the language uh, in administrative uh, 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 rulemaking. Uh, and, and therefore, the rescission was um, invalid. Um, uh, the, the government, obviously, uh, uh, took the opposing view. They were represented in the Supreme Court by the Solicitor General. Um, one of the interesting things for the argument is, as Jeff alluded, there were, there were uh, a number of cases that um, had been percolating up through federal courts around the country, uh, and they were all consolidated before the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Supreme Court then uh, allotted uh, an, an hour to each side mm -hmm. uh, for argument. Um, well, that was easy for the Solicitor General. <laughs> He's just one guy. But uh, uh, we had to work out amongst all these parties and different cases who would represent uh, the DACA uh, uh, parties at, at the oral argument. Uh, and that that was a that those were some interesting conference calls. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but we ended up being uh, dividing our argument between two attorneys. One was the Solicitor General of the State of California. Um, he's in Javier Becerra's office, uh, and the other was Ted Olson, uh, who is uh, a well-known. Uh, conservative Republican uh, uh, attorney, former Solicitor General himself, uh, and, a, and a, a frequent advocate in the Supreme Court, had, had argued the gay marriage case. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, the way it goes is um, uh, the Solicitor General went first because they were the petitioners. Uh, um, Justices asked questions. Uh, then uh, uh, Mike got up, the Solicitor General for California, and then uh, Olson uh, got up. Uh, it's, it's really hard when you've been involved in a case. Uh, when you were involved in the original decision making, all the way now up to oral argument in the Supreme Court, because you really want to go get up yourself and say, well, but wait, you should think about this, and you know, whatever. But, you know, so you're sitting there quietly. Um, uh, Why didn't you, you argue you it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, um, you, you know, and then, and then you're, everybody, um, you know, afterwards, um, uh, we came out on the Supreme Court steps, and there were all these DACA students who were there, um, hundreds and hundreds uh, on the steps. And uh, the media is there as well. And, and so uh, we, we did a, a bit of a press, uh, press avail um, on the steps of the court. Uh, and, and of course, there's a lot of tea leaf reading. and. You, you know, body language reading, you know, well, Justice Gorsuch leaned forward then, and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, really, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I cannot tell from the oral argument itself uh, how the court will render its, its decision. So we're in limbo. Uh, um, and in the meantime, the university is doing some uh, planning. Uh, what do we do if we win? What do we do if we're unsuccessful? Uh, what do we do uh, if the 
court somehow splits the baby. Um, and uh, uh, Jeff, when do you think we'll get a decision? Um, I think uh, uh, the, the smart money is that, that there will be one of these end of the term June uh, rulings right at the end before they go on their summer break. Um, but it's one of those things where every, every Monday when they're announcing decisions uh, starting in about March, you know, you've, you'll be sitting on pins and needles. Um, but the good thing, and we've got these nationwide injunctions in place. Uh, the government has never tried to uh, get those injunctions uh, stayed during the process. Um, and so, you know, every day that goes on, uh, DACA participants are renewing uh, their DACA grants uh, and extending uh, their term uh, two years into the future. Um, so during the injunction, you know, half a million uh, DACA participants have renewed their grants uh, more every day. Um, and anybody who's renewing now um, is renewing uh, into 2021 when the world might look different. Uh, so uh, from, from our perspective, uh, the Supreme Court can, can take its time. Thank you for your thoughts. We want to open it up now um, for questions from the audience. We have about 10 minutes um, for questions. Anna, over here. Uh, what was your no, hold on, there's a microphone. What was your personal drive to really be involved in this, each one of you? Was there something personal that touched you, you wanted to be involved? Number two, was that a pro bono work? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, I've been invested in, in DACA from the outset um, uh, um, because it um, just seemed to me unfair, unreasonable, uh, unwise for young people who grew up in this country, uh, uh, their only um, uh, legal problem is that they're undocumented, uh, that they would be subject to the full force of uh, the, the immigration enforcement machinery of, of, of the country. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, and, and in terms of pro bono, I'll let Jeff answer that. Uh, yeah, so to take the, the second question first, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a pro bono effort that the firm has undertaken. Uh, We've had uh, more than 24 lawyers uh, at Covington work on the case uh, as it's worked its way through the system. Um, and, you know, and for us, I mean, for us, as a, 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 it's, it's antithetical to the purpose of the conference. Don't work for law firms, uh, <laughs> uh, go into public interest. But you know, for our firm, it's, a, uh, it's just a core, you know, bone deep commitment we have to, you know, to give back. Um, and, uh, and, for, and for me in particular, I think this case, um, it's about the Administrative Procedure Act, but I, I really think it gets deep into, you know, what this country is and what it means to be an American. I mean, these are, these are people who came here as children uh, and have done everything that our society has asked of them. I mean, they are in school. Uh, they have unblemished criminal records, they're raising children. Uh, and to me, you know, it's not that they're Americans in every way except in paper, they are Americans. Um, and this case is about, uh, is about protecting that and about you know, deciding what kind of a country we're going to be. Um, and so when the opportunity came to, you know, to get involved and to try to make a difference, uh, uh, we were delighted to follow the president's uh, lead. We'll take another question. Oh, oh hi. Um, well, thank you very much for the, um, for the talk. Um, I, rather than a question, I do have one comment and one suggestion. The comment is that I was a DACA recipient, and um, when I first heard that the, that the program may be rescinded, I was wondering if I had to um, rescind, uh, withdraw my law school application. Um, and it was because the DACA got continued that I decided to continue pursuing my education. Um, because at the time it just didn't make sense to me that I should go to law school if it wasn't clear that I was even going to be able to get a job after I graduate with all the loans and all that. I, it just didn't seem 
wise. So uh, thank you for um, all the support that you've shown to all the DACA recipients and to their families. And the suggestion is that um, it, it's been my experience that it's very difficult to find resources for DACA recipients in law schools, whether it's financial aid, uh, whether it's career advice. Um, understandably so, because there aren't a lot of law students that, were, that used to be undocumented, uh, but I just had to learn the hard way that even if I wanted to apply for federal law, intern, uh, uh, excuse me, federal government internships, I can't because I am not a US citizen. Um, that I can even apply for clerkships because I'm not a citizen. So um, um, if possible, uh, I would, it would be really great if law schools provided some more resources um, for undocumented students. Thank you. Well, you've got the right audience. The deans are here, so um, I, think, I, think, I think that's great. Your point is well taken. Over here, there's another question. Hi, um, my name is Nina. I'm a UCLA law student. Um, and taking uh, off from what you said about protecting DACA students from immigration enforcement being why the why you decided to do the lawsuit. Um, I was wondering if you and maybe the deans as well could talk about how um, several of the UCs have a career day, a public sector career day, where um, ICE and CBP have been invited in the past, and including this year, CBP is invited um, to the Southern California Consortium Public Interest slash Public Sector Career Day at UCLA Law. Um, so I was wondering if you and maybe the deans could comment on whether that would be something that would be continuing in the future. Yeah, yeah let me just say that we generally um, uh, um, uh, have the campuses and the schools of the campuses uh, resolve uh, who uh, will be at their career day. Um, you know, I would just uh, uh, point out that um, CBP does, uh, uh, is a lot more than uh, border uh, protection. Um, it's the Import Export Act in enforcement. Uh, it's cargo screening at foreign ports. Um, uh, it's a lot of uh, uh, laws involving uh, uh, technology and uh, uh, different kinds of uh, trademark and copyright issues. So it's, it's a lot more than uh, the, uh, the Border Patrol. Um, but um, I'll let the dean address it too. Thanks for your question. And um, I'll share here, you're about to get an email from Brad Sears and Beth Moeller and me um, telling you that CBP is not coming this year. Uh, they will not be participating in our day. They will be collecting, re there will be an opportunity to collect resumes for anybody who, act, who may want to pursue that, but they will not be on campus. Um, and we look forward, we wanna have a broader conversation about this. Um, I do think, I do think it's, it's harder than it first appears both for the reasons that President Napolitano just described, that, that the ambit is bigger than what, we, what you might think. Um, also because there is a space between our students' safety on campus, which is clearly a major concern, including the safety of our undocumented students. So if we think that their presence could pose a threat on that level, that's something that I think it is my job to take incredibly seriously. At the same time, the fact that they may do some things that I may not approve of or think are, are the right direction or may not be my politics, I also know that it is not my job as dean to be imposing that kind of um, political litmus test on potential employers for our students. That's, that is a form, I think, of, of problematic overreach when when 
deans and administrators can have a huge variety of views. You shouldn't want my views, whether or not they agree with yours, to be that litmus test. So the space between safety and these broader issues is one that we need to explore and, um, and thinking about you know, the discrimination dimensions versus these broader questions. So they're not coming this year. You can know that. We stand ready to have some of those broader conversations. Um, and that's where we are now. But I appreciate the question. We haven't had that issue come up yet at UCI Law this year, but I wanted to say something because the question was for the deans to respond, and I certainly did not not want to respond to that in, uh, and leave the impression that I felt differently than what Dean Manukin just stated. But I agree with her analysis completely. And I, I do want to say that one of the things we so value, both Dean Manukin and I, are all of you raising these issues, these incredibly important and fraught issues, because when we start thinking, if we just want to talk about the, the border patrol, given my prior work in immigration, I find a lot of what they do deeply offensive. I also find a lot of what many law firms do deeply offensive. <laughs> I also find what some government organizations do deeply offensive. And so this is not Obviously, I'm not saying this to you. It's, it's those, the amazing those, work those, you're doing. It's, it's those other law firms. Yeah. No, no. But, but no, the, reason, the, reason I think it's, the reason I think it's important to say that is to echo what Dean Manukin said. We want you to push us. That is what we want. And then we have to make very difficult decisions. And those decisions are complicated and so fraught. And once we start down this road, and I think we do need to have these important conversations, just remember, it's not, there's no simple answer to it. So I just wanted to respond to that very important question. Thank you for raising it. And, and, and to add to this conversation. So thank you. These are the types of conversations we should be having as a community here, especially this community. So thank you so much. One more question. Um, hi, I'm Sydney. I'm from UCI Law, Milano. Um, and I was just wondering what uh, larger implications you think DACA, this DACA case has on um, getting more universities and larger education organizations to um, go against the federal government and their decisions to um, do things like this. Great question. So, um, you know, the University of California has has always been a leader in so many things. And it seems to me as the greatest public university in the world, we ought to be willing to take leadership positions uh, up to and, and including cases uh, that implicate the, the rights of, of our students and members of our community. Um, uh, and so we, um, you know, I, I, that's why I asked at the panel this morning, uh, I asked the deans, what other cases are out there that we ought to be looking for? Um, uh, you know, um, logistically, uh, how the Supreme Court rules will affect all the universities around the country that have DACA students. Um, uh, and a number of them participated as friends of the court uh, um, in, in, in the pending litigation. So they filed amicus briefs. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, I think the broader implications of the case, and I'd be interested in, in, in Jeff's analysis here, um, is um, how the Supreme Court views the Administrative Procedure Act and whether it uh, is going to hold this administration um, to uh, the current requirements as we read them under the APA uh, or uh, whether it is going to say that uh, uh, the executive branch can uh, eradicate uh, a, a very uh, uh, 
big program that affects hundreds of thousands of lives uh, with really no administrative record behind it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, you know, there, there are different ways that the Supreme Court could resolve the case, both in our favor or, or against us. Um, but I, I would say there's major implications to how they do it. Um, the, the Administrative Procedure Act you know, came out of something which was the, you know, the creation of the administrative state. Uh, and the basic deal that it embodies is, all right, we're going to give the executive branch you know, a tremendous amount of authority um, you know, to do all kinds of things in American life. Um, but the deal is, you, if you're going to do it, you need to explain it in a way that's transparent to the public. It needs to make sense, um, and it needs to be reviewed by the courts. Um, and uh, I think in this case, if, if what this administration did to justify this type of policy decision is enough, uh, you know, I don't know that that basic deal uh, has a lot of teeth anymore. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, significance, uh, you know, in, in the basic constitutional framework to this uh, to this lawsuit. Um, you know, and I think just the biggest consequence is, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who are directly affected by DACA and the entire American society that is indirectly affected by the program. Um, so this case is a, it's a big deal. And, uh, and I think because it's a big deal, um, you know, the courage uh, that it takes uh, as the leader of an institution like UC to, you know, sort of take a, an unbelievably public position against your successor, um, that's, uh, that's powerful and courageous, and, uh, and uh, it's been such a pleasure to be involved. Thank you. So I want to thank um, both President Napolitano and Jeff Davidson for being here with us today. Obviously, the DACA case is a case of profound significance. Um, as our panelists have said, it's a case that affects real lives, and so we all are going to wait for the Supreme Court's decision very anxiously over the next several months. Um, but thank you so much for your leadership on the litigation. Thank you for your courage, as Jeff said. And um, thank you for being with us today. So, all right. Thank you all. <laughs>